The founding of Beaverbrook Reservation on the Belmont welfare border was a pioneering for several reasons. Not only was it the first park established by the Metropolitan Park Commission, it was the reason the Park Commission was founded. The beauty and the reverence for the natural features of the park sparked a movement to save the land from encroaching development for, and for public enjoyment. In my lecture today, I will review the history of the land comprising the park, the factors that contributed to concerns about the future of its attributes and the process of establishing the park. My interest in Beaverbrook Reservation stems from two factors. First of all, my grandfather, John Hearn, was the MDC police officer who was in charge of the park from the 1920s to his retirement in 1952. My parents' wedding reception was held here and we've had many family photos taken there. Secondly, I grew up about a half a mile from the reservation and we spent many days exploring the woods, catching tadpoles and skating on the duck pond. Let's take a look at the land before it became a park. When Watertown was founded in 1630, the original boundaries included what is now the municipalities of Watertown, Weston, and Waltham. Uh, Weston was founded in 1713 and Waltham was founded in 1738. Much of what you see, what is now Waltham was divided into four squadrons. Uh, and the squadrons ran east-west, and here they are, the four squadrons. Uh, in this map, you can see the historic boundaries. Uh, if this, came from, this map is in uh, Bond's Genealogies of uh, Watertown. The town of Belmont was established in 1859 and is comprised of land that had formerly been part of Watertown, Waltham, and West Cambridge. West Cambridge is called Arlington now. Before 1859, the Watertown-West Cambridge boundary ran along Concord Ave. And before 1859, the land that would later become the Beaverbrook Reservation was situated entirely within Waltham. The Waltham Watertown West Cambridge boundary, and I, I, I wonder if there had actually been a, uh, a boundary marker there at one point. It was in the vicinity of the uh, Belmont Day School on Concord Ave on, on Belmont Hill. The Waltham border extended down to the intersection of Pleasant Street. Here you can see where it says Waverly Company. This is Pleasant Street here. Uh, and on this map, you can see uh, this Howe and Company. Uh, and I'll point out, by the way, that on this map, it's the Woodford uh, map of Waltham, and it's on the Harvard University web, uh, library website. The, the buildings that are uh, drawn in outline are residential, and the buildings that are solid are outbuildings. So we see this Howland Company listed uh, where Beaverbrook with a duck pond uh, would be. And this was a, a, a company um, that was uh, owned by Jabez Howe. Uh, they were assigned by the bankruptcy court uh, the mortgage uh, that David Kendall uh, owned on the, the Nathaniel Plimpton Mill. So, uh, the, and the other interesting thing is that Samuel R. Payson worked for Howe, um, and he ended up later purchasing the property. Uh, and uh, Samuel Payson is a big figure in, Wal in Belmont history because he purchased the, the Cushing estate and Payson Park is named for him. The Beaverbrook Reservation is a 59-acre public park under the care and control of the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation. The reservation spans the border of Belmont and Waltham and is divided into north and south sides by Trapolo Road. There are two man-made ponds on the north side called the Mill Pond and the Duck Pond. 
The elevation drops about 60 feet from a high point at the mill pond to a low point at Trapolo Road. And as a result of this drop, the flow of Beaver Brook forms a cascade below the duck pond. The first Europeans explored and then settled in the area in the 17th century. But Native American people have lived on the land all around us since the retreat of the last glacier in 10,000 years ago. The people in the eastern part of Massachusetts formed the northern edge of a, of a of settlement of a tribe called the Massachusetts tribe. And the local tribe was called the Quasset tribe. Here is the town seal of Watertown, and it shows the exchange of gifts of a bass, a fish, and a biscuit cake uh, between the Native Americans and the Puritans who were led uh, by Roger Clapp. Archaeologists have identified two Native American sites within the park on the south side. They also located a site uh, an earlier site from th that was in existence from 2500 to 1000 BC time period, uh, farther downstream along Beaver Brook. The archaeologists who surveyed the park also claimed that Trapolo Road and Mill Street were Native American pa uh, pathways. And that would stand to reason because they, the Native Americans would have used a trail to travel between Beaver Brook and Hardy Pond, and Hardy Pond was also a known uh, Native American site. In 1630, English Puritans led by John Winthrop settled in four communities in Eastern Massachusetts, Salem, Boston, Dorchester, and Watertown. Watertown initially encompassed what is now Weston, Waltham, Watertown and Belmont. The section that became Waltham was called the Great Dividends and it was divided into four squadrons running east and west and each squadron was divided into lots running north and south. So here you can see the squadrons running east-west and here are the, uh, the lots running north-south. The land that now comprises the Beaverbrook Reservation was located in lot number one of the third squadron, uh, colored here, uh, which included what is now the Duck Pond. The land of Beaverbrook Reservation that was included in lot number eight of the fourth squadron the squadron line ran just south of the mill pond. Here's the squadron line between the fourth and the third squadrons, and it runs right through the reservation. Uh, and that will be of interest, uh, you know, later on, and I'll point that out. Watertown parceled out lots of land to the town's residents in 1636. Lot eight in the fourth squadron was allotted to Richard Sautel. There's some question about when Sartell settled on the lot since he moved to Groton in about 1662. And he was the first town clerk there in Groton. But he moved back to Watertown in 1665 and he probably built a house on lot eight in that year. His son Enoch, who had been born in Watertown in 1656, inherited his father's house and land. And uh, his father died in 1694. When Enoch Sautel died in 1741, the house and land went to his son, Richard. And Richard then sold the property to Joseph Wellington in 1755. Joseph Wellington sold the land and house to his son, Joseph Jr. in 1773. Nevertheless, Joseph Wellington Sr., he didn't live there. He lived elsewhere in Watertown. Uh, and what his son would have been 21 years old in 1755. So what I'm thinking is that because some other landowners in Watertown also did this, that he was buying up property 
for his children so that he could make sure that the children were stayed around uh, in the Watertown area. So uh, and Joseph Jr., when he purchased the house in 1773, I think he was already living there. The meets and bounds of that deed identified the land of Toby Cambridge on the south in 1773. And we'll see more about that shortly. Uh, the reason I mentioned it is that it proves basically that Joseph Wellington lived on lot number eight in the, in the fourth squadron. So Joseph Wellington Jr. held a number of positions in Waltham town government. He was a surveyor, assessor, Hargreave, De Deer Reeve. Joseph Jr. sold his property to Phineas Stearns in 1787. In the 1792 probate records for Phineas Stearns, his sons, John and Palig, they were looking for extra consideration in the probate process. They claimed that they had built a grist mill for their father. So uh, the this is the first time that I saw in the deeds any mention of a grist mill. Um, so that so perhaps the first grist mill on the mill pond might have been built around 1792. The son John Stearns sold the property and house to David S. Eaton in 1809. There's some confusion over the history of this house, which is at 154 Mill Street. But the deeds and the newspaper records show that while the house may have, it, it, what the history, a written history had said that the house had been built by a Captain John Eaton in 1750. Uh, but the deeds and the newspaper records show that while the house may have been built in 1750, uh, Joseph Wellington purchased the property around that time. There was no Captain John Eaton who ever lived in the house. The property went to John Stearns in 1792 and he sold it to David S. Eaton in 1809. David Eaton had been born in New Hampshire. His father, John Eaton, had been born in 1751 in Reading. Massachusetts, and he moved to New Hampshire by 1776, where David was born. So David's father, John, always lived in either Reading or Amherst, New Hampshire. And not only that, but the father hadn't been born in 1750. So David S. Eaton was in the West India trade, and he had a store in Brattle Square in Boston. In 1814, he was known in Waltham as Captain David Eaton, and he led a, what was called a Corps of Exempts in Waltham. This was a local militia, and his title of captain may have actually referred to his being a sea captain. The 100 volunteers in the militia helped strengthen the fortifications in Boston Harbor during the War of 1812. Thomas Stearns, who lived along Trapola Road on a nearby lot in Waltham, was a fur trader. He had a store in Brattle Square in Boston also, at the same time that David Eaton had his West India goods store there. So it was likely that they knew each other at the time that David Eaton purchased John Stearns' house. And, you know, I'm guessing, you know, that Thomas Stearns may have said, hey, I know a house for sale that you might be interested in. So David S. Eaton died in 1818 at the age of 42. So he only lived in the house for nine years. His heirs sold the property to Josiah and David Kendall in the following year. Josiah lived in the house at 154 Mill Street and his brother David ran the grist mill. According to the, an 1859 lawsuit involving a dam upstream on Beaver Brook, a new grist mill was built by the Kendalls in 1820. The house stayed in the Kendall family for well over, uh, well into the 20th century. Uh, and actually that court case that I found was quite interesting. That's the first time I've seen it, although I had heard about it. Uh, so, and I have some, 
guesses as to where the dam may be along Beaver Brook. Here is an interesting document showing the tax valuations for 1771. It shows Joseph Wellington next to Samuel Stearns and nearby William Ruggles. It shows the number of tan houses, mills, the net property value, and the number of servants for life, which would have been enslaved people. Also, it showed the number of livestock and acres of pasture and tillage lands. The Joseph Wellington entry shows that he had one horse, one house, seven cattle, 10 goats, two swine, 16 acres of pasture, five acres of tillage, six acres of upland, and eight acres of fresh meadow. Also note, if you look at William Ruggles here, this here where it says two, that uh, indicates that he had two mills. Uh, he also had two horses, two cattle, two goats, two swine, 23 acres of pasture, one and a half acres of tillage, and three acres of mowing land. So that's kind of uh, significant and interesting because I'm not sure where that grist mill actually uh, was located. Uh, I don't think it was the one on the mill pond. This, uh, by the way, uh, you can find on the Harvard University uh, Baker Library website, there's an interactive database there. One last observation about lot number eight in the fourth squadron was the mill pond, or what I call the mill pond lot. There, was a st there is a stone wall that's still there and it runs east-west along the squadron line that I pointed out earlier between lot eight and lot one. It's located just below the dam um, and the falls for the mill pond. It runs exactly east-west. The Waltham Historical Commission has surveyed many stone walls in the city and we've found that they run along the original 1636 Watertown land boundaries. Without further examination, we don't know the exact age of this stone wall, but the base of it could date back to the 17th century when Richard Sartell owned lot number eight. The adjacent lot to the south, which is lot number one in the, thir the third division, uh, and it was awarded to Thomas Arnold in 1636. Uh, and as you can see, it is included what is now the duck pond. Arnold sold the lot to Thomas Boyden before 1650 when Boyden sold it to William Clark. Clark sold it in 1651 to Timothy Hawkins Jr. Timothy Hawkins had been born in England and had migrated to Watertown in 1633. In 1662, Timothy Hawkins sold three quarters of an acre of land with a pond to Thomas Agar of Roxbury and for the intention of having a fulling mill there. In the following year, Agar sold the land and the fulling mill to Thomas Lovren. Lovren had an apprenticed with a textile manufacturer in England and had migrated to Watertown in 1663, which is the same year that they, the lot was sold. So, you know, I, I kind of wonder what was going on there. Uh, Thomas Agar had, had the, the mill only a year when he flips it to Thomas Lovren. And Lovren emigrates the same year that he buys the land. So Lovren ran the mill uh, for six years uh, when he sold the mill back to Timothy Hawkins Jr. and Benjamin Garfield. This is an image of a 1661 fulling mill in England. Uh, the fulling involves two processes, scouring and milling woolen cloth, uh, milling uh, meaning thickening. Woolen cloth was beaten with wooden hammers, 
known as fulling stocks or hammer, uh, fulling hammers. The machine was operated by cams on the shaft of a water wheel or a tappet uh, wheel. And th what that did is it lifted the, uh, the hammers. So the process was powered by the water wheel. Um, and I have to say that having these hammers pounding continuously must have been a rather noisy spot there. So this would have been the first textile mill in Waltham. <clears throat> Most histories end with the 1662 mill of Thomas Agar. But the deeds show that there were fulling mills continuing at this site throughout the 18th century. In the early 1700s, Samuel Stowell, who ran a fulling mill in Newton, purchased the fulling mill on lot number one from Jonathan Poole of Reading. The mill passed to Samuel's son, Thomas, in 1748. William Ruggles, who had been born in Billerica, and he moved to Waltham in 1764 after his marriage. By 1771, so Ruggles ran a fulling mill there. By 1771, he was looking to move and the property was sold by auction in 1772, after which he moved to Lemonster and he died there in 1778. Here is a 1771 advertisement placed by William Ruggles, who was trying to sell his farm and mill. The farm contained eight acres and another 20 acres of pasture. The buildings included a house, a barn, a grist mill, and a fulling mill. So it was two mills. So we saw as in the 1771 tax valuation that there were two mills on the property. So it's unclear just where the grist mill was located. The Ruggles land buildings and mills were sold in 1772 to Toby Cambridge of Lynn. The ad states that Toby Cambridge was a recent Im English immigrant and he not only operated a fulling mill, but he also manufactured wool and dressed and dyed blue wool, cotton and linen cloth. Uh, and we had seen earlier that when Joseph Wellington sold lot number eight to Phineas Stearns in 1773, the property was bordered on the south by Toby Cambridge. So this proves the location of the Joseph Wellington house. Uh, and I also would, would mention about Ruggles is that in later deeds in the 19th century, the Kendall deeds, they refer to the mill as the Ruggles mill. Uh, lot number uh, one in the third division, the mill lot, uh, was purchased in 1778 by Joel Dix, who had married, who he had married Martha Wellington, who was the daughter of Joseph Wellington. Joel and Martha Dix moved to Boston in the early 19th century. By 1838, David Kendall owned this duck pond or mill lot, lot number one in the third division, and he sold it to the mill rights to Samuel Brooks and William Shepherd in 1838. And this is a view of the house and the mill wheel uh, from Robert Morris Copeland's book. But the deal may not have worked out because it's 1840, Kendall sold the mill to Nathaniel Plimpton of Boston Plimpton ran a satinette mill there, which made tight, it, satinette is a tightly woven wool or wool cotton blend that was so tightly woven that it was nearly waterproof. And later on, they used satinette uh, to make uh, Union Army uniforms. The mill burned down in 1848 and Plimpton headed for California in the gold rush. He died there in 1849. The estate was bankrupt and the court assigned the Kendall mortgage to Jabez Howe, a wealthy Boston merchant. 
Samuel Payson worked for Howe, and we will see more of him in a minute. In 1993, the Boston University Office of Public Archaeology undertook the examination of archaeological sites at Beaverbrook Reservation. They produced this image of the remains of the lower dam uh, next to the Cascades. So I took this map and colorized it uh, so that the uh, wheel foundation would be more visible. Um, so as you can see, the, the wheel foundation here and perhaps the mill race uh, below. As I mentioned, David Kendall sold the mill lot and the rights to Nathaniel Plimpton in 1840. Nathaniel Plimpton operated a satinette mill, which manufactured, as I mentioned, tightly woven wool or wool blend cloth. Kendall held a mortgage for the property. The mill caught fire at midnight in October 1848, and it was totally destroyed. And I have to say, this seems suspicious. You know, when something catches fire in the middle of the night, you know, in a building where nobody's living in it. Uh, and uh, also, Plimpton heads out for California shortly thereafter to dig gold uh, in California. And he died in the following year in California. His estate was bankrupt and the court assigned the mortgage to Jabez Howe, a wealthy textile manufacturer. One of his employees was Samuel Payson, who later became an owner of this property. And this would explain the Howe and Company that we saw on the 1854 map. By 1857, Robert Morris Copeland was the owner of the property around the duck pond. Robert Morris Copeland was an, a landscape architect who had been born in Roxbury and attended Harvard College, where he became lifelong friends with Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. He went into business with Horace Cleveland and designed Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in Concord, Mount Peak Cemetery in Waltham, and as a matter of fact, he and his family are buried at Mount Peak. He also designed Oak Bluffs in Martha's Vineyard, as well as many other places. He moved to the house on the Duck Pond uh, at, in 1857, and it was there that he wrote a book, Country Life, a handbook of our agriculture, horticulture, and landscape gardening. Published in 1859, the book became, quickly became the Bible for scientific farming methods. And it went to six, of, uh, six editions eventually. The book incorporates drawings of scenes around the site from the waterfalls and also Plimpton's water, uh, mill wheel. Also, Copeland was the first person to recommend the formation of a metropolitan park system years ahead of uh, Charles Eliot. Among the many admirers of the landscape at Beaverbrook was the poet, James Russell Lowell, who wrote the poem, Beaver Brook in 1843. And here's a portion of the, the uh, poem. It's uh, much longer in length. And I included in my bibliography for this, a, uh, a link to the poem. In the poem, he described the grist mill on Kendall's Pond and uh, which, uh, we call the mill pond now. These are two views of the mill wheel that stood in place uh, well after set, uh, Plimpton's satinette mill burned down in 1848. The one on the left was drawn by uh, Robert Morris Cope for him. He didn't draw it himself um, and is shown in his book, Country Life. Um, so that's only about 10 years after the mill burned down. The image on the right is a, a copy of a photograph of a painting by Winslow Homer. The photograph is owned by the Belmont Historical Society 
and is on display at the Belmont Room of the Belmont Public Library. Textile mills had been operating for 186 years, from 1662 to 1848. But the use of water-powered industry ended when that satinet mill burned down in 1848. By the 1870s, the main resource for businesses there was the ice on the ponds. In 1872, Robert Handyside purchased the property alongside the duck pond and ran an ice business. The pond at that time was called Handyside Pond. The photo on the left depicts the house at 66 Mill Street. That's the house at Beaverbrook Reservation. In my family, uh, my mother and my grandparents always referred to their house as 66 Mill Street. Uh, so uh, that's a, a photo of the house at the time uh, when Handyside was, owned the property. By 1882, Samuel R. Payson had purchased the duck pond property and he purchased the land at the mill pond in 1892. But Payson didn't live on Mill Street. In 1866, he had purchased the Cushing estate called Belmont at the corner of Trapolo Road and Common Street. He owned a number of textile mills in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. He had started working with Jabez Howe and eventually bought out the textile manufacturing company. So it's un unclear if any ice business continued after 1882 when Payson purchased the property until uh, Howard was there or whether anyone uh, was living in the house. In 1892, William C. Howard purchased both properties of the mill pond and the duck pond. And in the following year, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts purchased the Howard properties. William C. Howard lived in Watertown and his ice business was headquartered there. He owned a number of ponds in Newton and Watertown when he purchased the properties at the mill pond and the duck pond. So uh, William C. Howard placed this Add in an 1893 Watertown directory. And in it, he claims that the water in Kendall's Pond came directly from the Belmont Springs. Now, you know, my mother always said that there were springs on the property and that the, she claimed that they were part of the Belmont Springs. But most of the water in the Mill Pond would have come from Beaver Brook. So I guess this is a bit of uh, advertising exaggeration. So to summarize the land on the north side of Trapola Road in the late 19th century, the Duck Pond lot or lot number one in the third squadron went from Robert Morris Copeland to Mary Brown to Robert Handyside, who was an ice dealer. Handyside sold the property to Samuel R. Payson who lived at the Cushing estate. The last private owner was William C. Howard, an ice dealer. The Metropolitan Park Commission purchased the property by eminent domain in 1893. For the Mill Pond lot, or what was lot number eight in the third, fourth squadron, the Kendallers sold the property to Samuel R. Payson in 1892. And he then sold it to William C. Howard as a matter of fact, the uh, Belmont Citizens Forum recently ran an article about the history of the ice businesses in Belmont. Um, and what they stated that Howard actually blew up a large rock that was in the middle of the mill pond so that he could deepen the, the pond. The Metropolitan Park Commission purchased the property by eminent domain in 1893. So let's take a look at Beaverbrook Reservation on the south side of Trapolo Road. The Waverly Oaks were a group of 23 oak trees. Mostly, uh, most of them were situated along a glacial moraine that ran parallel to what then was called Quince Street. 
Uh, nearly all of these trees were white oaks. Uh, there was one called a swamp oak um, there, but 22 of them were white oaks. A moraine is a deposit of rocks and dirt left by a glacier during the ice ages. Quince Street, by the way, uh, was renamed Waverly Oaks Road. In 1892, some of the trees on this glacial moraine were estimated to be over 400 years old. And one tree had a girth of over 17 feet. Their branches extended out at a 90 degree angle from the trunks. So in order to do that, the, the trees were likely to have grown up in an open field environment, probably pasture land. This suggests that they may have been growing since the 17th century when the European settlers first established pastures. As a matter of fact, that was part of what they call Pequasset Common, uh, which encompassed the whole uh, Waverly Square area and was a common uh, grazing ground or pasture ground uh, for the Watertown folks. People have loved the Waverly Oaks, the mills, and the Cascades since at least the 1840s when James Russell Lowell wrote his poem, Beaver Brook. Artist Winslow Homer created a painting, Waverly Oaks, in 1864. The falls, ruined mills, and ancient trees were so popular as a place to sketch and paint that the Boston Art Club in 1880 urged their preservation as a setting for artists. Harvard treasurer and naturalist Frank Bowles was a frequent visitor and wrote about this landscape in his 1892 book, Land of the Lingering Snow. By 1892, Waverly was easily accessible by streetcar and train from the population centers of Boston and Cambridge, and development was expanding out from these urban areas. Samuel R. Payson, who owns the land on the north side of Trapolo uh, Road, was having financial difficulties, and this may have led him to sell his parcel to ice dealer William Howard. As early as 1884, the Massachusetts Horticultural Society visited the Waverly Oaks and they advocated for their preservation. In 1890, Charles Eliot wrote a letter in the journal Garden and Forest, which was published by Harvard College's Arnold Arboretum. In the, in the letter in which he advocated the preservation of the Waverly Oaks and its natural landscape, he also proposed the formation of a nonprofit organization that would hold parcels of land for the enjoyment of the public in the same way that a library holds books and an art museum holds paintings. And in an 1892 letter in Garden and Forest, Sylvester Baxter proposed the formation of the Metropolitan Park Commission and the use of eminent domain to purchase the land. Here are a couple of images of works that were inspired by the Waverly Oaks. On the left is some sheet music entitled Through Waverly's Ancient Trees. It was published in eight, 1908 by H.R. O'Terry. Uh, he spelled it O-T-E-R-Y. Um, and it was played that summer by the Waltham Watch Company Band. O'Terry had, for this sheet music, he had changed the spelling of his name. He was actually Harry O'Terry, O-T-E-R-I, and he was a barber, he had a barber shop on Church Street in Waverly Square, and the, his family lived on Grant Avenue in Belmont. And that family, the Oteries, are still around in Belmont to the, uh, even now. The image on the right is uh, a painting, uh, Waverly Oaks, painted by, in 1864 by Win Winslow Homer. This painting is in uh, the uh, public domain now, and you can actually download uh, a high quality image from Wikimedia, or you could order uh, one of the, a print of it from one of the many sites that are online. 
Sylvester Baxter alluded to the difficulty uh, in purchasing the land that would comprise Beaver Brook Reservation because there were problems to the title of the land. This stemmed from a decades old dispute among the heirs of Samuel Stearns over the administration of his, of his estate in 1817. In the 17th century, an earlier Samuel Stearns married the daughter of Timothy Hawkins and gained ownership of lot number one in the third division, in addition to his own parcel on lot number two. Uh, his descendant, also known uh, as Samuel Stearns, had been born in 1739. He married Mary Bigelow in 1760, and the couple had 13 children. He was a successful farmer who sold produce, cider, and I, am, I say a lot of cider, and particularly to Harvard students. Uh, he sold meat and wood also to a wide circle of friends and neighbors. His customers included uh, wealthy merchants in Charlestown, Boston, and Brookline as well. The, he had a, a, what was what they call a day book, which is basically a business journal. The first volume of his day book is available online on the Harvard University's Baker's Library website. And here is a page actually from that day book um, showing so the sale of veal in 1772 to his neighbor, Joseph Wellington. Samuel Stearns died in 1817 in testate, that meaning that he died without a will and his many, many children spent the next 100 years fighting over the estate. Because the title of the Stearns land was still in dispute, the Metropolitan Park Commission, now called the Department of Conservation and Recreation, uh, was established so that it could be given the power of eminent domain. Uh, and this would be, they would then be able to overcome the title question. One of the key players in the movement to save the Waverly Oaks was Charles Elliott. He had been born in 1859, and he was the son of Charles Eliot, the president of Harvard College. After graduating from Harvard in 1882, the younger Eliot studied horticulture at Harvard's Bussey Institute. This was located uh, in Jamaica Plain on land that would become Arnold Arboretum. He then began working for Frederick Law Olmsted and Company as a landscape architect. In 1890, he published a letter in the journal Garden and Forest, which uh, this Garden and Forest was a journal established by Charles Sprague Sargent, who was the founding director of the Arnold Arboretum. <clears throat> In the 1890 letter entitled Waverly Oaks, Eliot advocated for the preservation of the ancient trees, as well as the formation of the nonprofit organization that would hold land for the enjoyment of the public, like a library or a museum. That letter eventually led to the establishment of the trustees of reservations. Elliot died of spinal meningitis in 1897 at the age of 37, but his legacy included the design of the Charles River es Esplanade, the acquisition of riverfront land along the Charles River in Boston, Watertown, and Newton, and he was the inspiration to establish Acadia National Park in Maine. Inspired by Eliot's letter in Garden and Forest, leaders of the Appalachian Mountain Club held a meeting at MIT to address concerns about the loss of open space and the preservation of the landscape. This led to the founding of the Trustees of Reservations, 
This is the oldest nonprofit land trust in the world. It was established by an act of the Massachusetts legislature in 1891. And uh, the, there's a cop, this is a, uh, shows a, a, an image from the 1891 act uh, by the ed legislature. But they soon encountered the probate dispute among the heirs of Sam Stearns as an impediment to the clear title. In an article in Garden and Forest, Sylvester Baxter advocated for giving the Metropolitan Park Commission the right of eminent domain to settle the title question. He referred, by the way, to the adjacent hill as Helmet Hill. We call it now Owl Hill. Uh, and he suggested that they include a portion of the hill in the park for Beaverbrook Reservation so that people could go up to the top of the hill and view the landscape. Baxter wrote a series of articles in the Boston Herald calling for the use of eminent domain to create a regional park system. <clears throat> As a re result, the Metropolitan Park Commission was established by an act of the Massachusetts legislature in 1893. The act authorized the commission to take land by eminent domain. It became the first regional park system in the country. Soon after the passage of the legislation, Beaverbrook Reservation became the first acquisition of the new commission. The land at Beaverbrook Reservation was acquired by eminent domain from seven landowners, and the, fund, the taking was funded partially by the Atkins family of Belmont. Thus, the movement to save the Waverly Oaks spearheaded the foundation of the first land trust in the world and the first regional park system in the country. Let's take a look at some of the parkland on the south side of the road. On the left is an 1892 map showing the owners of the properties just before the land was taken. Horace T. Stearns, uh, who is up here in the upper right, uh, he was the son of Thomas Stearns that we heard of before. Across the street, the Ward heirs were descendants of Samuel Dexter Ward, who had died in 1871. Samuel Dexter Ward, by the way, was the grandson of General Artemis Ward of uh, Revolutionary War uh, history. Samuel Ward purchased part of the Stearns estate from James Stearns in 1848. As of 1892, the Ward estate had not been settled. Uh, which is another reason for its taking. So it's 20 years later and it still hadn't been settled. On the right is a photograph published by Charles Elliott uh, at, in 1897. It, it was taken from the moraine uh, where the Waverly Oaks are. Basically, it, it seems like it's from, if you're in the parking lot and you start down the hill, you get that view overlooking uh, the broad plain below. Um, and so it's looking southeast into what are partly abandoned pastures. Let's take a look at some historical photographs of the Beaverbrook Reservation. And here we see two views of the Cascade and Falls. Um, and uh, the, the one on the left uh, I got at the Massachusetts State Archives. Uh, and I should mention, by the way, that there are more photographs uh, on the website called Digital Commonwealth. Uh, some of those are from the 1950s. And the reason I didn't incorporate them was because there were some usage restrictions on them. But you could go to Digital Commonwealth and take a look at them as well. And here we see two photographs of the old Waverly Oaks, the original Waverly Oaks. Um, one of them is quite nice because it shows it in wintertime. And finally, we have a photograph on the left of what is believed to be the last of the Waverly Oaks. This is now in current day. The rest of the Oaks died off in the 1930s, some of old age 
and some perhaps due to the application of tar. When the branches fell off, back then they would uh, paint tar over the, the scar that was left. Um, and some people think that this poisoned the trees. Others think this tree is actually not one of the original Waverly Oaks, but rather an offspring. And on the right, we have the cascade, and it's a video that I took last spring. So we will end with a short view of the cascade. And I should just mention, I also um, prepared a bibliography. Uh, and in the bibliography are hyperlinks that when you click on them, they will take you directly to many of the um, sources that I mentioned, like Land of the Lingering Snows, uh, Country Life by Morris Copeland. Um, and uh, the, uh, some of, there's also some very nice articles that were published in Atlantic Monthly, in Harper's uh, Monthly. Uh, and the one that I liked the best was published in 1896 by Joshua Kendall. Um, so uh, we'll end it with a, a nice view video of the falls uh, and the cascade at Beaver Brook.